Welcome to ThoughtWorks. I'm sure you'd have waited tough traffic outside to come here, right? So welcome to the 26th edition of our Geek Night. Before I tell you a few lines about what is Geek Night and all of that, let me ask you a few questions, right? Okay, if this is the 26th edition of Geek Night today, can you guess what, what was the first edition of Geek Night? At least a month. on which Geekness has formed and ThoughtWorks has sponsored it and our passionate programmers have built it. So uh, there's one more thing, if any of you are interested to come as a speaker, you can reach any of our volunteers and register yourself as a speaker. Okay. I mean it gives us a chance to get, get fresh perspectives from outside ThoughtWorks and it would be great to have you as a speaker. Okay. Uh, with this I'll hand over to Shiva who will introduce our speaker. Right. Yes. So today uh, we have Sunil Mohan here, so he'll be uh, uh, doing a talk on scaling the game server applications. Uh, let me uh, introduce about Sunil in a minute. So he's a lead developer in ThoughtWorks. He's graduated from IIIT in Hyderabad. He's graduated in 2003. He has about uh, 30 to 14 years uh, software uh, industry experience. He's been doing the guest lecturing at IIIT Hyderabad. Uh, he's an uh, volunteer in Swetcha and he's an acute developer in Freedombox uh, software. So, any of you have heard Freedombox? So, do you want to brief? Alright, yeah. So, Freedombox is a tool, uh, it's an open source hardware tool, so Sunil can speak for days on Freedombox. So recently Sunil and his team, they have implemented uh, Freedom Box of, uh, in uh, one of the village, uh, Ganga Devanapani. It's completely free uh, for the entire village. There are about 1000 plus people living in that village and uh, that covers the radius of about uh, 800 meters or a kilometer. So and the entire village is using the free internet service which is delivered through the Freedom Box. Um, so Sunil can talk more about that. So whenever you get to talk to him after this talk, this session, he can share all the details. Um, yeah. So this is about Sunil. Um, so you can 
All right, with the help. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, uh, before, uh, am I audible? Okay. Uh, before I joined ThoughtWorks three months ago, I uh, I was doing consulting work, and uh, as part of this consulting, I consulted on various free software technologies, mostly around architecture, did coding, or whatever was needed uh, in a particular project. Uh, sometimes I just went to solve problems and so on. And one of my favorite areas I worked on was uh, scalability and uh, looking at server architectures. And uh, today I'm going to share with you one of those experiences uh, uh, I, uh, I had about five years ago, but, but the architecture is quite uh, relevant today. Uh, although I'm going to talk about game server, uh, it is also, it, it's kind of a superset of what, what we use for regular web applications. So it will be useful for web applications as well. And the, and the format I intend to take today's talk is uh, a tutorial. Um, I will be covering basic concepts, not giving you tips about advanced uh, uh, topics. Uh, so if you have uh, 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 built an application, server side application, you, you'd like to scale it, this is most useful to you. Um, so let me get to the problem. Um, so this was a game server where uh, about less than 10 people would, uh, would come in and interact online. And the game was running on a web browser. And uh, people interact with each other through this game. There are a whole bunch of rules for this game and what they are are not really important for our, uh, for our exercise. It's just that people uh, uh, play turn-wise games. Uh, and uh, once a player plays, then uh, the turn goes to another player and then uh, they play and so on. Uh, but the number of players is going to be very large. Um, uh, so 5,000 players. Uh, so kind of uh, when we set out to do the scalability thing, we kind of overdid it, uh, uh, overshot uh, to uh, 100,000. But uh, the, the real requirement was about 5,000. That's what we set out to uh, do. Um, and, uh, uh, Users have accounts, uh, and these accounts uh, require uh, certain uh, transactions on them, uh, so that uh, you know. Let's say a, a, a player gets credited because uh, a, a player won the game, and then uh, another player loses some uh, credits because uh, uh, he or she lost the game. So that kind of transactions also happen. And another interesting aspect of all of this is when people are looking. Um, uh, when a whole bunch of players are playing the game, um, we need some statistics. Um, uh, type X game, so many people are currently waiting for other people to join. Um, and type Y game, uh, so many people are already playing. So this kind of information we need, and we need it on a real-time basis. Um, and this information is, uh, is sent to everyone who is uh, looking at what is known as the lobby, which gives information about, uh, tabular information about, uh, 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 what uh, kind of games there are and what kind of uh, 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 what are the numbers number of people uh, playing that game and so on. So that kind of statistics we need and we need that uh, to uh, update real time. So that's another uh, uh, interesting problem. And of course, everything needs to be highly available uh, so that even as server goes down, you know, uh, the business is not affected and you know, people are uh, continuing to run the uh, game server. So these are the basic parameters for the game server. By the way, please uh, keep this uh, discussion oriented. You can stop me anytime and ask a question. Uh, I, I'm mostly talking about uh, uh, my experiences and how we made the choices. But if you have your own experiences, you can you can share them, or you can bring up uh, a particular technology and we can uh, try to compare uh, as a as a group here. So uh, discussing the solution to this problem is the agenda for today. And it's roughly divided into six sections. Uh, basic things like load balancing, probably we all know, um, uh, uh, application um, application level load balancing, and then uh, storing logs with the uh, NoSQL database, also using our SQL database later, uh, and then a public subscribe model, uh, event-driven programming. We probably used it, but not seen it pro from a, pers a performance perspective. And then uh, finally doing performance testing uh, of all the things that we did. So this is the layout for today's talk. Uh, and uh, this is how we started actually. I, we didn't start from scratch as an application. The application was already existing and uh, it was built on a you know, kind of uh, a quick uh, 
uh, iteration kind of uh, building. Uh, so I think two people built it over uh, or of uh, six months or something. Uh, and then um, the game had a lot of complex logic and so on. They that's that's what their focus was mainly on and not scaling up. So once it went to production um, and then uh, uh, people started to uh, come in, users started to come in. That's when the uh, uh, performance uh, bottleneck hit, and then that's when uh, we started working on the problem. And this is a very typical model again. You know, uh, startups, uh, you have the product out, uh, even non startups, you have, have the product out first and then worry about scalability uh, and other uh, quality aspects uh, after, um, after the problem comes. So it was a C C C plus. So all the uh, uh, web browsers were actually hitting the uh, web server. Uh, this is the game server actually, not not the web server as you can call it perhaps. Um, and uh, it was uh, making uh, uh, TCP requests uh, from the web browser using Flash. Um, and uh, uh, and there was only one web server, uh, only one server uh, basically. It, uh, the server was quite good. Uh, it had uh, 24 cores, uh, actually uh, 12 cores with high preferring 24 cores. Uh, it had like, uh, uh, I think at least 32 GB RAM um, and, and uh, lots of nice uh, server statistics. But, but this server was uh, struggling to keep up with 500 uh, players playing simultaneously. So essentially they were uh, doing a lot of operations uh, per second, uh, but it's not a lot actually, 500. Um, but uh, uh, because of uh, various uh, poor choices in programming, um, they were actually creating a separate process for each game they created. And because uh, uh, the game server has to anticipate a lot of uh, uh, players coming in at, uh, at peak times, they always ran a um, lot of games uh, at the same time, even though there were no players uh, playing those games. Uh, and creating an each pro uh, each one process for each game means that uh, we ended up with uh, hundreds, uh, uh, close to a thousand, two thousand processes running uh, uh, on the server. Even with 24 cores, that starts to uh, uh, show performance bottlenecks. Uh, the first uh, and the easiest thing we can do is uh, load balancing, right? So take one server and make sure that. Uh, uh, Take multiple servers and make sure that multiple users are using different servers on the table. So uh, that would look like this. Uh, each uh, each uh, web browser would uh, connect to a different server. A bunch of web browsers would connect to a, to a server. Another bunch would connect to another server. This can, I, I mean, even though this is a very simple model, many times it can work out. Uh, for example, you, uh, uh, you, uh, you sent your users to a different uh, uh, region altogether, India. Uh, game.com and uh, you know uh, some other country game.com and they're just playing in a different server altogether. That's a simple way to uh, scale. That's also I guess counts as load balancing. Uh, but uh, when you don't want to do that or uh, the business does not work out that way, uh, then uh, uh, we can consider using a load balancer. Now a load balancer can be a software or a hardware. Hardware devices uh, essentially are uh, a bit pricey, uh, hard to maintain when you're testing uh, and doing a lot of uh, setups and so on. Uh, they are a little bit cumbersome, but software load balancers also can deliver uh, a lot of performance, as we'll see one uh, one solution that we chose. Uh, so imagine this device is a load balancer for us. So what does a load balancer do? So you, you're getting requests um, uh, onto your server. Load balancer is the one that receives it, and uh, it chooses on a particular uh, uh, configuration parameter, it chooses to send that request to one of the uh, backend games. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, that could be either a HTTP request, uh, in, in which case the web browsers are uh, just trying to load pages, or it could be a TCP request, and those TCP requests can also go um, load balance like this. and uh, uh, load balancer essentially has some configuration set up uh, uh, with which it uh, it can choose one of the servers arbitrarily. Uh, most of the time it's just random load balancing. So if, uh, if a particular server is already taking 100 connections uh, and another one is taking 900 connections, you can actually send more requests to that 900. 
that also is taken care of. But generally, it's just round robin. You send one request here, one, uh, one request here, one request here, or you will just say randomly pick a server and then just send the request there mm -hmm. to that server. Random means that it ensures that okay uh, everything gets balanced out over large numbers. Um, but uh, your application has to be built in that way. So I built a uh, let's say a web application where uh, you have uh, the login request going to one server and uh, another request which is to access the account page after the login going to another server. Um, I've logged into that server, and that server stored my session uh, in a state file, like you wrote a typical PHP application or uh, some Ruby on Rails application. Um, and uh, that, that session state is uh, saved in that server. So the login cookie is recognized by that server, and then uh, after the login is successful, the second request went to this because the load balancer doesn't know anything. So it just uh, uh, picks another server next time the request comes. So then uh, we have a problem that this server says, I don't know anything about this session. So you're, you're uh, potentially not a, a logged in user. So, and then access to nine comes up. Uh, which means uh, I, I brought in this because uh, I'm saying that your application must be built in such a manner that, uh, uh, that in order to accommodate this error. And most of the time, it's just very simple thing to do. And if, you, if you're coding with this, uh, architecture in mind. Just assume that your uh, whatever application you built will be deployed in multiple instances which don't talk to each other. Then uh, uh, it becomes much easier to deploy in this scenario. So one common technique to solve this problem is this. You put up uh, uh, your sessions not into files and so on, uh, local databases, but instead uh, to a central database. So you can have a regular SQL database where you, as soon as you create a session, just store the session there. Whenever you want to check whether the session is valid or not, uh, use the database to check the session. But more, more and more, uh, uh, actually, uh, memory store, in memory store, such as uh, uh, Redis, uh, Memcache, and so on, um, they are uh, very popular for that kind of thing. Uh, the downside is that if, if the memory store goes down, all your sessions are lost, and then all your users are shown in a login page. It's not too bad. So, uh, and then there are ways to mitigate that problem also. So, uh, memory store is very good for this problem. Uh, there is another way uh, we can solve this problem also. Uh, some uh, applications have very complex state, for example, games. So, uh, 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 close to a dozen people are interacting with each other and they have, uh, uh, they have complex rules on how they interact in the and the uh, uh, state of the game actually changes in a, in a complex manner. So always trying to save the state of the uh, game to something like a database or a memory store might be very expensive. And uh, an alternative to that would be uh, to say, oh, no, I'm not going to uh, save the state of my game every time something happens in the game. Uh, but instead, I will keep it in the game server, but somehow, Everyone who is playing that particular game must come to that server. Uh, that also we can do by specially configuring uh, the load balancer. So load balancer typically has a configuration uh, which is if you see a certain kind of cookie, if somebody comes with the same cookie again and again, uh, always send them to the same server. Uh, or you can say, if they have a particular HTTP header which says uh, HTTP header uh, X equals to Y value, uh, based on the value of Y, send them always to the same server. Or you can say, uh, okay, uh, when when launching a game, you can say mygame.com slash game ID equals to, uh, question mark game ID equals to Y, right? And based on that Y value, you can say always send uh, Y users to that particular server. And, and so, uh, when you have this complex state to manage and you don't want to save that state all the time to, the, to a centralized store and check it again back uh, whenever a request comes, uh, this is a pretty good option. And this is what we chose for the case of the game server. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is how we use the load balancer. And the load balancer we chose for, for this purpose is, uh, uh, is known as HA proxy. It's a very famous load balancer. Uh, it's a, 
uh, free software application, meaning uh, it gives you the freedom to deploy anywhere and uh, use it for any purpose and even modify it, get the source code and redistribute for commercial purposes and so on. Um, and it has uh, lots of features uh, such as uh, SSL offloading. You can uh, you can say that uh, from the client to the load balancer, it's an SSL connection. Now after that, to your server is actually regular uh, plain traffic. Uh, that way, your your application need not be configured for SSL, and you know one problem is uh, uh, is gone there. Uh, later we'll see that uh, we are going to use web sockets for this application, so uh, HAProxy has support for that. And uh, HAProxy is so good, it, it also uses something called event-driven uh, model, and we'll also discuss more about event-driven model, why event-driven model is efficient. HAProxy implements event-driven model, and because of that, uh, it's very well implemented, and uh, it's a, it ends up uh, 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 dealing with a 10 gigabit uh, connection very easily on a single CPU. You give it one core uh, of a CPU, and then it's able to uh, process so much information, um, so many requests and data uh, that you can choke an entire 10 gigabit Ethernet connection before you need more CPU. Uh, so you can uh, look at the benchmarks here, but uh, uh, this uh, this is a pretty strong recommendation. Uh, that's what we chose. In there. So that's uh, topic one for us, uh, using your load balancer. Um, any questions so far? Um, anything you'd like to point out? Say, yeah. Yeah. So we used uh, game ID as the parameter. So uh, we launched a certain games of uh, certain types uh, into certain servers, and then and people wanted to join in. Uh, they had to come using that game ID. So we use the game ID as the parameter to do that uh, sticky uh, load value. Yes, yes. Uh, it's not necessary though. You can run the same server, same type of game in many, many servers. But once the game starts, it has that uh, state in it. Yeah. One instance of game can be only in one server. Right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. So we limited to that, and that uh, allowed us to have uh, a lot of uh, ease in terms of programming that game. We don't have to load the state and then compute the next state and then uh, go back. Uh, the, the state is always there, and anybody who interacts with it, we can easily compute the, the next state. So states are like variables, but not uh, data stored as key value pairs in database and so on. Uh, so one of the requirements for this game was that it was very complex. So there are lots and lots of rules there uh, uh, and variants and so on. And uh, actually coding the game itself becomes like very complex. Although it looks like we put in a lot of effort into scaling, actually we didn't. We put most of the effort into uh, the logic of the game. Uh, that's where uh, the actual uh, business is, and uh, uh, this is just like one of the aspects of the project. When you used the uh, HA proxy, right? So was the uh, was the con was the configuration fixed, or were you varying it in production? Um, or did you have to tune it on the fly for any reason? Um, Of course, I mean, we will require some tuning at least, uh, because uh, uh, once uh, we start uh, loading the server with lots of connections, we will find that, you know, some kernel parameter, some uh, some limit has hit, and then, oh, there is such a limit, and then we increase that limit. One such limit is the uh, file descriptor limit that, that is there on every daemon. So that's the first thing you will hit. Um, after uh, approximately, 1024 on, 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 on Linux systems is the limit for each process, and we have to increase that uh, to uh, get anywhere. So we did some kind of tuning, um, if that's what you mean. It's a pretty static configuration most of the time, yes. Another one. Assume there is a single player game. Yeah. Assume there is a single player game. Yeah. Assume there is a single player game, and the number of players are playing that game. 
cells is one in the cellular level or uh, only there that the cell is having sound. There are the same name, but obviously, must be a single cell. Yeah, uh, so uh, the question is I mean, um, if we have uh, a single player game, does each player have, have a different instance of a game? Um, and yeah, obviously, if, multi, if it is multiplayer, then um, in one instance, people have to interact. We have like uh, 500 users and uh, uh, each play, uh, maximum 10 players in one game, right? So that means that there are at least 50 instances of a game. Uh, same thing happens with the single player. So if if, uh, if a single player is playing uh, one game and then another player is playing another game and so on, we had like multiple instances coming. Same game. Yeah, yeah, same game. Because you know there there was complex state in the game that we had to maintain. So if you if uh, if multiple people join the same game in the same server, we could theoretically keep it as the same instance, uh, but then we have to uh, keep two states. And make sure that you know the game is waiting um, for that player at a particular state and doing some activity, doing timeouts, and a whole bunch of things. Uh, uh, so ultimately, if you think of object-oriented programming, you you have like a class and you created two instances anyway. Um, in practice, also that's how it is. If you're creating two instances means that you're just creating two uh, instances of an object. Uh, but if uh, if it's across uh, servers, of course, it's different processes and all together. We, in fact, created several processes, and each process had multiple instances. How about handling, handling failure? So let's say you keep your state in one of the servers, and that server goes down. Yeah. Uh, so the way uh, in production it went it was that we didn't handle the failures. If the, uh, if the game went down, uh, that game doesn't come back. The overall game farm is running, you, you just go and play in some other uh, instance after that. Uh, but uh, we actually planned uh, for automatic restoring uh, later, as a, as a later step. Where we would store the state of the game into a central store. Uh, and then if the game went down, uh, then we would fetch the state back, but not otherwise. We planned that but never implemented. The, the database was common. Uh, we will discuss more about uh, how we deal with database. Um, but anything that is that was related to accounts and transactions and all that, we used a regu regular SQL server, and uh, we stored the data in that common server. Uh, yeah, I uh, we didn't do step by step. We did it in all one shot after preparing the uh, grand architecture and um, uh, and deploying it all at once. Because typically scalability for which team to look at memory and database and stuff like that. And one of the things is look at load balancing. So, um, in this particular case, we had the option of completely rewriting the application. The client said, do whatever you want, uh, uh, just just do a clean architecture this time, uh, completely re rewrite it. But we may not always get that uh, uh, luxury. And then uh, we can actually start attacking step by step. So, I, I work for other clients where one application was taking uh, too much, uh, uh, too much uh, resources and it wasn't scaling. So the first thing we did was uh, do load balancing by putting the sessions somewhere else. Um, and then we didn't require a lot of application changes. That was a Java application. So we put, uh, we used the Java session um, saving uh, uh, library, which stored into a uh, database. And then, uh, um, and then after that, uh, we just turned on uh, this load balancing and then we got an instant win. After that, we started attacking other problems. We did database optimization, query optimization, indexing, and a whole bunch of other things for that. So when you say rewriting, C++ was not older. Yes. So it had to be in C++. No, uh, that was the earlier application. But we later chose Python. So whatever that 
multiple instances, multiple servers, now the Python application. Yes. Yes. In that case, why do you have a Java apps around your uh, things built in, right? Uh, such as? Uh, Sessions and thread tooling and all the like, simple setups in an actual Java. You don't have to write any code for that. So why do you go for the actual Java components? A lot of other languages and frameworks also give us the same uh, uh, set of libraries. So we do have a flexibility. So we could have uh, easily chosen uh, Java. Also, okay. So uh, the next topic, which is uh, uh, how do we manage uh, these uh, real-time events from the server? So uh, people are playing, and it, whenever some some uh, particular player does an activity, that activity has to be conveyed to all other players in the world. and that has to done, be done as fast as possible, as instantaneous as possible. And uh, we are on a web browser. So we need to uh, do that using uh, whatever web browser is capable of. Uh, the first initial application was using Flash, um, but the, the later application we had a choice of mobile and uh, uh, Flash and HTML5 and so on. Um, so we had to work with all of those technologies within, with that in mind. So um, for that, what we chose was uh, web sockets. Um, HTTP, when HTTP 1.1 was going uh, uh, well, web sockets picked up in popularity a lot. Uh, but then we moved to HTTP 2. Uh, web, HTTP 2 does not have a proper replacement for web sockets yet, so uh, it's it's in a kind of limbo state. But we can we can surely use web sockets uh, in today's browsers. Most uh, mobile as well as uh, 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 mobile as well as desktop browsers actually support uh, web sockets properly. Uh, the way WebSockets work is they're almost like a TCP connection, uh, which means that uh, both ways communication ha can happen. Anytime server wants to send you some information, it can just throw a packet. Anytime client wants to send an inf a piece of information, it can throw a packet. And then um, uh, what kind of packet and what data you put is completely up to you. You can, you can use JSON objects or you can use XML or whatever you want. Um, or you can have a custom protocol. Uh, but uh, it's it, that, that connection does not start that way. It's a regular HTTP connection. So uh, you know, get so and so with the uh, host and all of those HTTP headers are sent first to the server uh, as a regular HTTP request, and then the server responds back with, "Oh, let's upgrade this to WebSocket." Upgrade meaning that okay, now both sides understand that uh, from this point onwards, we are going to do that packet communication instead of. Uh, HTTP headers and all of that. And uh, after this initial uh, exchange, we, uh, we can start to do anything we want on that uh, HTTP domain. So it's like uh, passing uh, uh, request from server to the uh, Correct. So both parties uh, uh, can do asynchronous communication. So simultaneous uh, duplex communication is possible. Uh, so typically in, um, in HTTP, uh, we send a request and wait for the response to come back. Yeah. And then uh, you cannot send a second request, at least not in HTTP 1. HTTP 2, you can do that. Um, HTTP 1, you cannot send a request. But uh, with WebSockets, after the connection is established, you can send a packet. You need not wait for the other packet to come back, or need not wait at all. And you can keep on sending your uh, your packets. The server can keep on sending its packets. So, and yeah, So it's like one-time connection, and then after that, uh, the like client and the server will be communicating through WebSocket, not through HTTP. Yes, correct. But it starts as a HTTP connection initially. It looks like an HTTP connection, uh, which is why uh, if you uh, if you take uh, proxies and all that, they think okay, you are doing a HTTP connection. Um, so if you are in an office environment and you are playing this game, right? Um, typically, many office environments have uh, proxy servers, and the proxy server anything it sees other than an HTTP request, it just says, ah, I don't. I don't care about this, no big terrains and no other kinds of protocols are allowed. Uh, only HTTP connections are allowed. That also was an advantage for us. Uh, we were no longer doing flash-based TCP connections. We were doing HTTP connections. HTTP connections. And so uh, uh, we have that advantage. And uh, works in most browsers. Uh, five years back, it was a little bit less. Uh, fewer browser, few uh, browsers didn't actually support. There was still IE9 at that time. 
uh, which was a horrendous thing. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and in order to improve the reliability, we had another option, which is to make it SSL. So uh, let us say there is a, a, a proxy server which is trying to somehow intelligently look at your HTTP headers and trying to do with the, something with dot headers. And then it doesn't know anything about web sockets. It'll just botch the connection and then you'll not be able to establish the connection properly. Even though it is like, it looks like a HTTP connection, it's still not fully HTTP, so it probably not, it does not work. So, but then if you turn on SSL, all the communication is on the SSL uh, 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 protocol, uh, 4434. Port. So when a proxy server receives an SSL connection, right, it cannot decrypt it. Uh, it's a, a bunch of encrypted packets came from uh, the client, and a bunch of uh, uh, encrypted packets came from the server. So it cannot do anything with that. Uh, it cannot look at uh, whether the content is HTTP or not, whether the uh, HTTP headers are referring to something or not. All it can do is just take this connection and uh, you know send it to the uh, server. So then what happens is essentially uh, proxy server cannot mess up with the connection and then you can make a, a much proper uh, SSL connection to the server. Uh, so this way we've achieved like quite good reliability even, even on uh, mobile networks and desktop networks and office networks which are a lot more restricted. We were able to connect our devices from all of them. Uh, by the way, web sockets. Uh, okay, uh, right. Uh, I I'll talk about that particular uh, issue later. But there is another mechanism. If let's say web sockets don't work at all, or you don't want to implement the complexity of web sockets by introducing a server on your server library on your uh, on your server component, or you don't want to take the uh, uh, pain of writing a different kind of uh, uh, HTTP call at all. So then, uh, this is an option: uh, long polling. Uh, this is a pretty simple technique. Uh, maybe a lot of you have already used it. The idea about this is uh, uh, the client actually makes a request and then the server does not respond. Uh, it just keeps that uh, connection waiting. Uh, for whatever time it takes, uh, it might time out uh, or it might say after 30 seconds, I don't have anything. So that's what happened. Uh, so first uh, arrow here to the server side is the request coming in. And then uh, after that, th for 30 seconds altogether, the server does not respond back at all. And after 30 seconds, it says, oh, I don't have anything to give you. Uh, the request was successful, all that, but uh, there was no uh, event to give you because I don't have anything to say in that 30 seconds. And then after that uh, connection is immediately done, the client makes another request immediately, as fast as possible. And then this time uh, the server waits for some six seconds or so. And then uh, miraculously an event happens somewhere on the server side. And then that event we want to convey to the client. This time within six seconds, the, as soon as the event is, uh, uh, is, uh, is present, you, the server responds back and says, hey, I have an event uh, within six seconds, it says that. And this time, uh, the client again says, you know, uh, I'm initiating a new connection again. This time again, uh, the server waits. One of the two things happen, either the event comes and the server responds back, or after 30 seconds, it says, I have nothing. So uh, continuously, uh, the client has uh, kept a uh, connection open. That's what is happening. The client makes a request, after timeout, makes a request again, uh, or when the uh, event comes back, um, you make a request again. So one of these things happen. It's a pretty simple technique, very easy to implement. All you have to do is like, you know, in a while loop, whenever the response comes back or, you know, uh, in JavaScript, you either succeed or fail and then you initiate another connection again, as simple as that. So from the response uh, uh, aspect, uh, you either get something or not get anything. If you get something, act on it. If you don't get anything, just make another request on the client side. On the server side, it's actually quite easy, again. So you got a request, you say, oh, wait on a particular event to happen. You take a mutex or something like that. Then uh, somewhere else on your server, something happens, just release that mutex and then say, hey, uh, uh, here's an event. And then you respond to it. And then if the mutex times out, just tell the client that there's nothing. So it's very uh, easy to implement. But then there are some disadvantages to this. 
which is uh, okay every time uh, we are making a request to the uh, uh, to the client every time there is an event to convey uh, you are making a request fresh again and then every time you make a request you are sending all of those ugly http headers if it's a ssl connection uh, you are doing that ssl handshake after that uh, uh, yeah first tcp handshake happens then ssl handshake yeah, happens and then you send the http headers and then you convey your message uh, so, if you are getting events really fast or uh, you want uh, the events to be as real time as possible, then WebSockets are a better idea. But for simplicity of implementation or as a fallback mechanism when WebSockets are not available, this is a, a pretty decent idea. And uh, if you are using HTTP 1.1, right? So, on a single uh, connection to the server, you can make multiple HTTP requests. So, uh, so you, you send a request, request okay, that, that response didn't come back, or it came back with an event, then you can make a new request on the same uh, connection without breaking it. So that is possible. So slight advantage there. So that's uh, uh, my uh, topic to you um, on how we're dealing with uh, real-time events to the client. You were talking about uh, broadcasting the session is for it's a multiplayer game. So, if anybody who's playing the game needs to know about the current state of the game, right? So, we thought we'll lose the resource because that's the most difficult thing to do. But, meaning that is, there is such a smooth happiness in the world that it's already sitting in the world. So, my question is like, when you use the resource, so um, essentially when uh, a client connects to the server, that's one uh, open TCP connection. And we don't need to store this session information uh, for other servers to consume because as soon as this TCP connection is cut down, you're opening a fresh web socket session. As far as uh, typical authentication and cookies and all that are concerned, that's a whole different thing altogether. So as soon as they log in, they got a cookie with an authentication session. That's a separate aspect. But when you open a web socket session, as soon as the TCP connection for that web socket is cut, you don't care about that session anymore. Oh, I think I got your question. So, uh, uh, so everybody opens their own socket connection, and as far as the multicasting is concerned, there is some, something happened in the game, and you want to tell everybody about it. That actually, uh, you are contacting every single web socket connection. You have a list of web socket connections from the clients. You have uh, user objects. Inside each user object is one uh, handle for web socket connection. And then you iterate it through all those user objects, and for each of these web socket uh, connections, you send one event. Uh, event A happened, send event A to player one, player two, player three, and player ten. And every player is maintaining a separate connection altogether, and they are not uh, uh, related in any way. So if one player gets disconnected and reconnects, so that uh, TCP connection has been re-established, you get a completely different session, different handle and everything. My question is, it's very natural, 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 Yes. Uh, so uh, basically, we maintain queues. Uh, whenever we want to send something to the user, we would put it into a queue, and then whenever the connection is available for reading, we would consume that queue. So if somebody gets disconnected, the queue starts getting filled up, and then when they get reconnect back, they would get all the events. And uh, we would uh, we had also a very complex logic about 
how long the other players will wait for that player to come back and so on. Uh, so, so as to make sure that the recognition uh, uh, is as smooth as possible. In fact, that kind of a queue management was required, uh, was absolutely required for this. Uh, because uh, although we're saying that the client will immediately connect back after the first request is completed, there might be a delay, right? You're making a second request and then, uh, you know, uh, stars were not right on the network, and then uh, the, the, the second request got delayed. So the, after the first request, after two seconds, uh, the second request came, but within those two seconds, 10 game events happened. Uh, we want to convey those 10 game, game events as part of that second request. So, so we maintain a queue there for every user. And that, that's how it uh, worked out. Okay, so the next topic. Any event that happens in the game uh, needs to be recorded for later uh, verification. Um, uh, players sometimes come back and say, you know, what happened in that game? Uh, they call the customer reporting and, and say, that person abused me by calling me something. Or uh, that person cheated. Or uh, I wasn't able to uh, win, I was supposed to win. And whatever. Uh, reason they come back and ask. So we want to examine how the game went. And that means that we want to store how the game proceeded and we want to store all the events related to that uh, game. Uh, one simple idea is uh, just uh, write every, everything into a file. And uh, that mostly works. Um, but essentially we want to be able to retrieve uh, each game information separately. So that particular game ID, um, uh, I want the logs for all the events that happen in that particular game, give me that information. So natural solution is just write it into a different file uh, with that particular game ID. We have a unique game identifier, we say game identifier.log, and then start writing events to that, and uh, put that into files, and that mostly works. But there are some problems that are there. Uh, so we can actually store it into files, and then we want to retrieve on a particular game by game basis, uh, just keep it in a separate file. Uh, actually, this is not the most performance approach. Um, uh, a lot of people would think that this is the fastest solution that you can get. And the reason for that is, uh, is the way we have our uh, storage disks today. Let us say um, you have a rotating disk, although the same problem to some extent is also there in uh, uh, SSDs and so on. Uh, assume there is a rotating disk, right? Um, and it, the data is organized in sectors, and there is one head like this. So uh, the head has to move to the right, sec uh, right track, and then um, within that circular sector, it has to wait until that sector rotates and comes to that particular head position, and then it starts reading. And once it starts reading, if it has to read the next sector, it's easy, right? The ro uh, ro this is rotating anyway, just wait there, that the sector is completed, again, next sector, next sector. If you're reading uh, uh, sequentially, it's very easy. But if you want to do it, if you want to read or write randomly, then uh, starts the problem. So essentially, uh, you have waited there, you wrote one sector, one millimeter of uh, events, which is less than a kilobyte or something. And then you want to go somewhere else and write another event. So then, uh, first the head has to you know move there, uh, and then position itself there. Sometimes there is an error in that position; it has to correct itself a little bit. And then it has to wait, wait for the entire disk to rotate, and then the appropriate sector to arrive there, and then it starts writing that position. And this is a very very uh, uh, slow process on uh, hard drives. Even on SSDs, when you are reading um, sequentially, uh, the performance is much faster. And if you are uh, writing randomly, then uh, uh, writing or reading randomly, then the, uh, the performance drops quite a lot. In fact, it, it's, it drops so much that uh, we don't care about uh, how many uh, sectors or how much data we get when it comes to performance measurement in uh, drives. We mostly focus on I/O operations. So you went there and did one operation there. Went somewhere else and did another operation. How big and all that is slightly less relevant. Uh, how many places you went and how many things you did is more important. 
Um, so which is why if we start writing into different, so imagine um, we were running up to 1,000 instances of a game in a single server. And imagine, um, you know, all of those things producing uh, one event each, and uh, you're going to various places and trying to write, uh, write, it, uh, write it at the same time. It would be very bad for the performance. Uh, but then, if you write, open a single file and write uh, all of the events into that single file, it will give you much better performance. But then, you cannot access that data. Give me uh, the data for that entire game in one shot to me. That's, that's a harder activity. Um, right, so again, another problem is, okay, I stored the data in one place. What if that server goes down? What if the disk fails? What if the, that particular rack goes down or something like that? So we need to have redundancy in our, our data storage. That simple file storage cannot provide. Uh, there are many solutions, but the, the, but the solution we chose was uh, to use a NoSQL database called Cassandra. And uh, essentially, it's a cluster of nodes. And uh, you, can, uh, you can write to any node you want. And then uh, the cluster takes care of storing multiple copies of that. And it is like any any reasonably smart database. It writes it writes through a single file instead of multiple files. So um, any SQL non SQL database, when you are issuing multiple queries, right? It is writing those queries to the disk, but it is doing so into a single file. Later, it organizes them into into, uh, into whatever uh, data structures it wants on the disk. But then initially it writes all into a single file. So which is why Cassandra will uh, perform much better than writing into uh, just raw files. Okay, we'll look at uh, some more uh, uh, details of Cassandra. This is a very interesting topic for distributed uh, stuff. Um, but uh, uh, we are a little low on time. So we'll take a break, uh, 15 minutes break, and then we'll come back. Alright, uh, we'll take a quick 15 minutes break. Uh, we have uh, science arranged. Uh, we will be arranging in a while uh, in quick two minutes. Uh, we will be like this. Uh, stick around and get uh, with all, of, all other candidates. Uh, and you can also catch up with the link for a while. Uh, we can talk about uh, all the different uh, open source uh, software technologies. Right. So we'll uh, gather back in 15 minutes. But it comes with uh, so many problems. You cannot issue a secret file, which means even some simple joins that you have to do the But giving the people the but we could have used the, I mean, uh, it's whenever we try to do something in a 
SQL like in a non-SQL database is much harder. Um, you need to have a database in the and if you're doing lots of reporting also, you're going to be very hard. Uh, so, for, for, for this particular time, what we did was we separated the basis of uh, analysis processing and then transaction processing. So, transactions are like when uh, you have you need to do uh, some operations on uh, player account and as well as the player account. So, for that case, you can carefully choose uh, the Cassandra operation. You can, you can refer to a thing and go to a particular column and then update a particular that. That's fine. Uh, but if you try to do something like uh, how many users have have uh, done something today, that, that's, that is not going to work. So, for that kind of thing, you have an analytics process. Um, either you can stream all those events in the analytics uh, thing in real time. And what we did was, uh, you can actually do a run like this, which is more like uh, you issue a, you write a, a, a new map radius. Uh, today you probably have a But what we did was interactive query. Uh, uh, we used the Google's query. You can also use other things like Apache, there are a lot of products. Yeah, there are uh, a bunch of products like that. Uh, uh, for analytics process. Essentially, every query you hit and go through all the records in the database and then you do the result. And uh, that means that you can formulate your uh, query on the fly. You can say, I want this filter, that filter, and then it has to uh, modify and sort on this particular matter. And then you can you can issue that query without having any analysis on the any computer indices on the database. But most uh, uh, most recording is not done like that. Right? It, it, this is and we make sure that the computer values are there and so on. Um, so yeah, this interactive query we did uh, was like, you know, no indices, nothing at all. Uh, every query you give, uh, you can go and uh, collect data from 808 records or something. So if you have 10 million customers, then uh, that would be a lot more data. Uh, and uh, this particular thing was just for all. Second, 
discuss uh, some of that. Uh, but we were also processing those models. So we, we had uh, uh, we had a team of people coming from school and then all the data which was put into Cassandra and then we could summarize and put the summaries and so forth. And so we were also doing that. But in terms of the setup cost and all that, we found that of the distributed systems that are out there, Cassandra is actually a good one. Uh, that I will talk about. Uh, so how we got consistent. So uh, in our system it is guaranteed that we will never get an old uh, old value after the Sunday days. So consistency So we will start in five minutes. So, and all this was done in like three months. That, like, you know, 
it was time. Yeah, and it took longer time without scalability. It was designed, implemented badly. Uh, they were they were uh, creating a new process for every game. That was the major mistake. Otherwise, it was also even. Uh, this game happens to be uh, I/O intensive now. So on average, if you're using C Python, uh, Python can be as much as forty times slower than C. Uh, 40 times, as in, you know, this thing takes one second, that means it's 40 seconds. But then uh, the confidence in our choice came from the fact that it was an IO intensive. So sending these events to the uh, players and waiting for them to come back and making an SQL request or uh, editing the game events. This was more computation than doing something like, you know, you do a big computation and find a, a AI path to some players or something. Those were not sent. There is a game called Second Life, which is a, a, a massively multiplayer online game, yeah. um, and that uses Python and even the same stack. And they have a huge number of players. They are, I think, the more competitions are involved, uh, but they are also in the course of uh, Python. Um, basically, you have like a huge amount of code to write every week. Uh, you, you want to deploy fast. You, uh, you want to code fast. Uh, you, Today the business requirements come for something and they say, oh, uh, we tried this game, it didn't work, it didn't bring us any revenue, we just discard it and bring another page. So you need that scripting capability fast. Anything performance intensive, we can always do a fast module. Send those events in the uh, in that order, so we send also guaranteed the order. So we didn't maintain any particular order. So as the events were generated, we would put it to take from the JSON. As far as the timestamp is concerned, we already maintain the timestamp, but we didn't use them very well on the client side. So uh, later on, we started debugging issues of latencies and so on. So then, at that time, we started showing like an indicator to the player, like you know, we are bagging this one from the server. Uh, but beyond that, we need to use it. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons for the state for the game server was, you know, everything becomes easy, right? Uh, if we can go somewhere else, also in your application, it's slightly harder. Why the nature of that, uh, you know, uh, uh, over there is a little bit of synchronization. But here, uh, it's just that we had a simple uh, all right, people, uh, can we start now? Over to Sunil. discuss uh, some internals of Cassandra beyond leaving where it is and see why. Can the people hear? Can the people hear at the back? Okay. Can you speak? Uh, now? Yes. So I thought uh, uh, instead of just leaving at that, uh, we could discuss a little internals of Cassandra. It's a pretty interesting thing and it gives us a good perspective of how distributed systems can work and a lot of compromises, a bunch of algorithms, and of course, we get to know about Cassandra, we can use it for some project as well. Um, uh, so the way Cassandra works is there are a bunch of nodes, and uh, they know about all of them because they all talk to each other using protocol word gossip. That's fine. But, uh, and then whatever data I'm storing gets stored in one of these nodes. But I can connect to any of these nodes and ask for that data. Now it's the duty of that node to actually go and fetch that data. Uh, 
uh, of course, there's some internal communication there and it happens. But at, to me, as a client, I just have the convenience of contacting any node and asking for any bit of data. Another uh, interesting thing to notice is there is no such thing as a master or the centralized coordinator or any of that. Any of these nodes can go down and your uh, cluster is still working. Uh, we'll look at the replication and all that a little later. In terms of how data uh, can be stored in Cassandra, this is how it is. You have a key and then you have a whole bunch of columns attached to that key. So key is like your primary retrieval, uh, is your primary index and you have to provide the key in order to get any of the uh, values. Uh, of course, there are some range queries and all that, but uh, uh, I'll leave that up to you. So essentially, it's a key value store. You give a key and then you give a bunch of values actually, and then uh, those values are stored and you give the key back and you can retrieve all of those values. Now, this turns out nicely for us uh, because uh, Cassandra can actually store millions of columns and you don't have to define those columns uh, in advance. So you can keep on creating. And uh, and each row can actually have uh, a different uh, number of columns altogether. So each game, give it an ID, and then say that is my key. And then say whenever some event happens in that particular uh, game, uh, write the timestamp as the column name. And uh, whatever event happens, that event, entire data of that event, put it as JSON or something, and then call it the value. So you can keep on uh, 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 adding uh, columns to the uh, Cassandra. So uh, it fit the use case quite nicely here. And then anytime uh, customer support wants, like, you know, for, for this game, what happened? I can say, uh, give me the entire row for that particular key, and I've retrieved like uh, 1,000 or 10,000 uh, events. Uh, all in one shot and then sh formatted them and showed uh, like, okay, this is what happened. Um, we were also doing some other things, but not really <coughs> important. Let's get to the interesting bits. Um, how does uh, Cassandra store all of these uh, uh, key value stores? Um, how does it distribute across the nodes? So you have a key, you take a hash of it. And make sure the hash falls into the range of 0 to 2 power 128. So that's what it does. N is 2 power 128. And whenever you compute the hash, you will get a value in that range. Now divide that entire range across these servers. Now that node at the top is responsible for storing any keys with values 0 to n by 6. Probably n by 6 minus 1, not to bother with that, but you know, that range it stores. And then uh, the second uh, node is responsible for storing n by 6 to 2 n by 6. So the second chunk, third chunk, fourth chunk, fifth chunk. The fifth chunk, uh, until 0, uh, it stores. But there is a reason I put it as a circle. Uh, we'll get to that. Now, uh, there is no fun in just distributing the data across servers. If, the, if one server goes down, that entire data is gone. I mean, it could be a hardware failure or so on. Um, so what Cassandra provides is replication capability. <coughs> you can say, uh, when I create my table like this, uh, this table has to be re replicated across three servers or five servers. And then uh, Cassandra takes care of uh, uh, storing multiple copies of that data. How it works is quite simple. Uh, if you say replication factor two, then, uh, it, uh, the node number one, instead of just storing the data for that particular node, it will store all the data of the previous node as well, which is that, uh, you know, sixth node. And then the second node, instead of storing data about itself, it will also store uh, data about the first node. Actually, Cassandra has evolved a little bit more, and it, it is using slightly more advanced algorithms than this, but in order to give you a simple uh, view of things, I, I, I put it like this. So this is how replication works. So multiple copies can get stored. So you can have a cluster of 100 nodes, and you can say replication factor is five, which means that every piece of data that you write gets stored in five nodes each. And uh, the obvious problem is, now let us say I'm writing to multiple nodes, what happens to my uh, reading and writing and consistency? What happens if I write to one node and ask the data from another node? 
the uh, that node might say, hey, I don't have that data. Or it might say, uh, okay, old value, it might return. Or this got deleted, and then this node might say, here's the value. Um, so we might get these inconsistent results. So how does Cassandra deal with these uh, inconsistencies? Uh, so Cassandra provides what is known as eventual consistency. Um, so when you write to one node, that value will go into the other nodes eventually, not, not right away. When you actually write and Cassandra says, hey, I've written it, uh, it's done. Uh, but the data is only on one node, but not on other nodes. Um, so it provides what is known as eventual consistency, and it also lets you tune that consistency. This is how it works, very simple logic. Uh, you can choose to write to all the nodes. You can say, when I'm writing, write to all the nodes and only then, if, if the writing to all the nodes is completed, then tell me that it is done. You can tell Cassandra that. And then when you provide a value to a key, uh, it will store in all the nodes and then it will return the value as, uh, I'm done writing, so done. Obviously the problem is, it has to wait until all the nodes have been written to. And then write will be very slow. Not really, really slow, but at least a little slow. So what uh, what this is good for is when you're writing infrequently, but reading frequently. Uh, here, uh, there is a server at the bottom which is trying to read the data. That green is read and red is write. I forgot to label that stuff. But, uh, so the green stuff is actually reading. Now, because only after writing to all the nodes I have gotten the response, uh, if I go back and try to read uh, from the database, I can go to any node and ask for the value because that value is there in all the nodes. So that's how I can choose any node and then uh, ask the value from there. So reading, fast. I'm going to one node and asking the value. Writing, slow, because I have to write to all the nodes and only call it done, only then call it done. There's the opposite model also possible where I just say, write to one of the nodes and then call it done. But then the remaining nodes have uh, older values or no values or so on, right? Uh, there is a strict timestamping so that we can easily say which one is the newer value, which one is the older value. So that Cassandra maintains. So now I have written to only one node, but then I want to read the value. At the time of reading, I don't want a stale value. So what I'll do this time is I'll contact all the nodes and ask them for all the values. So, and then I'll compare the return values and then see which one is the latest. I'll pick the latest value. And then I always am guaranteed uh, the correct result. Right? And then, uh, so this is this is good for what? Writes a lot, uh, right? because writes are very fast, because you just have to write to one node and call it done. You can write really fast. You, uh, for our game application, we are writing like thousands and thousands of events per second. Um, and then probably reading once in a while when there is a problem, there is a complaint, somebody makes. Right? So uh, this model is very good for our game application because we are writing a lot and reading only once. So at the time of uh, reading, when we are trying to do reporting or uh, stuff like that, or uh, some customer, uh, a customer support agent is trying to re read the value, Oh, well, a uh, few hundred milliseconds of uh, latency is there while reading. We don't care. But then writing is happening really, really well. There is also a, a, a mixed approach we can take. Uh, decide on a number of uh, nodes such that uh, if, you, if you write to a bunch of nodes and try to read that many nodes back again, there is at least one overlap, overlapping node. So in this particular case, we're writing to three nodes and reading from three nodes out of total five. So at least there is one overlap guarantee. And so we are guaranteed to get the uh, latest value again in this case. And this is how uh, we compute for uh, ceiling of uh, n plus one value. So if it's 10, then six is the quorum. If it's uh, nine, then uh, five is the quorum. Uh, there are some other good uh, uh, things that Cassandra gives us. It has really good capabilities in terms of, I don't want to take my cluster down anytime, but I want to keep adding nodes because my data grew, or one node went down, I want to decommission that and add another node in its place, um, and I want to in increment the uh, versions of uh, Cassandra, 
uh, at least minor versions I think is possible, um, probably even major versions. So I don't want to ever take down my cluster, I, keep, I want to continuously manage the cluster. So it provides those very good uh, capabilities, millions of columns it provides. Um, uh, having loose schema is somewhat of an advantage. Um, you can always say for this particular key and for that particular column, give me the value. And it is fast enough. And you can also say for this particular key, uh, give me this range of columns. Or you can say, give me the values for all this range of keys. So these kind of things are possible. But don't go uh, picking Cassandra just like that. If you uh, choose it for uh, uh, cases where you need to do a lot of uh, SQL queries and uh, reporting and things like that, it could get really hard to manage it. If you have like a really big team and uh, which can do a lot of programming and take care of things and so on, uh, it works out, but uh, otherwise uh, stick to a, a SQL database. SQL has its good strengths also. Um, and these days, uh, many SQL databases also give you um, schema-free uh, schema capabilities. They also give you no SQL APIs, meaning that you can go to a SQL database and then uh, using a, a key value like uh, API, retrieve the values, and a whole bunch of uh, NoSQL capabilities are provided by SQL databases. So uh, do that uh, comparison before you pick. So that's uh, that's about Cassandra and how we store the log files. Okay, so uh, for the next topic. Um, we were having a discussion in the break, and then one of the discussions that came up was, uh, although I misunderstood the question, uh, uh, one of the discussion was that uh, I, I, I have a lot of uh, incoming connections, TCP connections, say 1,000, 10,000 in incoming TCP connections, and then they're all waiting for 30 seconds without doing anything. What kind of uh, uh, cost would that be in terms of resources for a particular server? So if I'm to uh, write simple servers, uh, a typical approach would be to create a thread or a process for each incoming request. Um, if you're using Apache Web Server or PHP, uh, Apache Web Server with the uh, NPM process worker, uh, or if you're using PHP, or most of the applications in uh, Java, uh, they're all in this model. Uh, threads, create a thread or a process for each connection. So whenever uh, a connection incoming uh, comes, a new thread is created and then uh, and then uh, uh, that particular thread is actually handling all the communication in that particular uh, connection. But the problem with this is we, we have 10,000 connections incoming, we are creating 10,000 threads, which, which means it's not even possible. Even uh, even with 32 cores or whatever uh, number of cores we have, it, it starts to look small. And uh, OS simply is not that good at uh, switching across all of these uh, these many processes and threads. Actually, it, it boils down to uh, poor implementations of threading models um, and uh, various uh, frameworks implemented differently. And so uh, your mileage may vary, but essentially. If you have to generalize, uh, this is how it is. Threads and processes for each uh, incoming connection is a bad thing. But there is another mechanism, which is event-driven programming. In event-driven programming, <laughs> every time a request comes, you don't uh, you don't uh, create a thread or a process. You just attach a callback and say, whenever there is data available, call this callback. Uh, but that kind of a thing you've already done uh, uh, quite a lot, possibly, because uh, if you look at uh, how you do a set timeout in JavaScript. You give a callback and say, after three seconds, uh, after three seconds, call this function. And then you don't do anything. You, you haven't created a thread and said, sleep for three seconds and do something. But you said, uh, okay, whenever that particular event happens, that th uh, three second timeout happens, then call my function. And then after you did the set timeout and uh, before the callback calls, there is no uh, thread existing for that to happen. Uh, there is something called an event loop that looks like that. So at the heart of every event-driven event, event -driven programming, uh, event-driven uh, framework is something like that. There's an infinite while loop, and uh, you're waiting for a certain event to happen, 
it could be a, a mouse click in, in case of a GUI a toolkit or it could be in case of a, a lot of IO related program it could be a waiting for SQL server to respond back with some data or some uh, particular event happens and that event happens you, 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 do, you do the callback for that particular event and uh, it's the programmer's duty not to wait until that something finishes but to attach a callback and finish immediately. Um, so this is a pretty good model for uh, scalability and HAProxy, Nginx and many other high performing uh, uh, servers are actually built on this particular model. Oh by the way, uh, there is one particular technique used to make sure the threads are not horribly uh, non-performing. Uh, uh, many of these servers uh, create a thread pool and then keep those threads idle until you get some request. Whenever the request arrives, uh, the request is sent to that particular thread and then uh, there is some this pool management, how many I need to keep, how many keep ballooning and all that uh, stuff. But uh, event driven programs need none of that because uh, an incoming connection means that it's just using up a 4 KB or so uh, memory but you practically lose nothing else. Uh, you must have seen uh, uh, event-driven programs uh, quite a lot. Uh, JavaScript in browsers are like the biggest example. Something happens, you have a callback. After the callback, you don't do infinite while loops in that callback, right? If you do, uh, your whole application is stuck because there's just one thread in JavaScript, un un unless you use web, uh, web workers and all that. But um, uh, Essentially, you don't do intensive computations in JavaScript after that function calls. You do some work, return back, attach a callback again, and then do some more work, and then go back. So you click something, on click event handler happens, you do something there, and then you return, and then some other event happens, and so on. This is how all event-driven programs work. Uh, but in case of a network, it's about uh, reading from files, writing to files, reading to sockets, writing to sockets, and this sort of activity, rather than um, uh, click events and so on. But at the heart of every event driven program is what you uh, just saw that infinite while loop. Uh, other examples are like this. Java also has pretty much all uh, languages now have solid uh, uh, solid event, uh, uh, event driven frameworks. So you can choose to uh, code using event driven um, uh, mechanism. Uh, the obvious advantage is that it is high performance, so there is only one thread. And then in that thread, you are processing several uh, events. So internally, how it works is you have a bunch of uh, sockets, uh, file descriptors, and timeout events. All of these are combined. And then we ask the kernel, wake me up when something happens on this set of uh, file handles and sockets, or this timeout happens. So you make that one call. And then the operating system will wake you up when something is uh, interesting happening. Uh, when there is a buffer to write, uh, when there is data to read, or when a timeout happens. So you will be woken up, then you wake up, uh, call the appropriate uh, callback, come back to the event loop, sleep again. So that's how a uh, typical event driven program so. so it's good for performance. Uh, sometimes handling synchronization is easier because if you within a callback, you're guaranteed that no other callback is running, which means that you don't have to lock your data structures and do do things inside it. So it's actually much easier to program. You don't have to log, synchronize, or anything of that sort. But there are major disadvantages also, uh, 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 which is it's harder to write. So if your threaded program looked like that, you had you have three uh, I/O operations, uh, which will block your thread. Uh, first one is a sleep, then is a SQL query, and then uh, uh, socket writing and things like that. Network operations basically. And in between, you're doing some uh, some more computations and things like that. Okay, so that uh, that particular program will will become uh, will look like this. So what you need to do is uh, perform I/O operation one, then attach a callback, uh, and that callback will be called whenever that I/O operation is finished. So and then uh, you make the SQL query again, which is the second I/O operation, and then uh, you will get a callback again. Uh, after that uh, SQL query is done and you have the results for that SQL query. And then uh, once the SQL query is done, you have to do some more activity. You split this all into uh, smaller, smaller callbacks. 
uh, JavaScript will ease you by giving you um, closures and so on. Um, and there are various frameworks to ease this mechanism, but that pain is still there. Uh, but uh, there are other ways to uh, counter that particular problem. Another disadvantage is that instead of looking for regular SQL library, uh, okay, you have a, let's say, MongoDB library. Uh, you now need a asynchronous version of that library, which will which will give you a callback mechanism in, instead of blocking until the uh, response comes back. If you block your entire application with all those 10,000 threads, it's like completely blocked, doing nothing. Um, so you need a callback mechanism. Uh, uh, so you need a, a library with asynchronous capabilities. So you have to go search for asynchronous libraries for all the things that you do. Uh, so that's a bit of a disadvantage. Python has a uh, uh, has a library called Gvent, which tries to which takes an interesting approach to solving both the problems. So the the rough way it works is like this. Um, so you say Gvent dot spawn, and then uh, it's like thread dot spawn, uh, but you say Gvent dot spawn, and then uh, you give a, a a function to it. Uh, that function will be like running a thread, and then uh, that could be doing blocking I/O operations, but you don't need to do any any special programming for that. Gvent automatically takes care of everything. So um, right, um, takes care of everything, and then finally you join uh, all of those threads, wait for all of those threads to finish, and then print the uh, values at the end. So uh, this is how uh, you you're almost spawning threads, but you're not actually spawning threads. What what happens is. Uh, if we take this particular uh, threaded program, you write it just like that in Gvent, and it looks uh, like this, exactly the same in Gvent. But what happens is, when it comes to the first I/O operation, Gvent will automatically uh, take a backup of your uh, Python uh, call stack, go back to the event loop, process the other events with other uh, uh, callbacks and all that. And then uh, once the I/O operation is done here, it will come back and restore the program, and then it will continue running from there. So in a hidden manner, it's like taking a backup of your program, saving the state, and then coming back when the event is ready to run. And this happens very performant in a performant way. So uh, you can, without modifying your program, you write your uh, single-threaded. Uh, single you, like, you write your programs just like you write your threaded applications, but it will work in an event-driven manner. And uh, another thing that uh, Gvent, oh wait, sorry. Another thing that Gvent does is, um, uh, it, it will uh, override some of the Python's internal libraries, uh, such as uh, socket libraries and uh, SQL libraries and so on. So what happens is, it, you are making a regular call, and then Gvent is internally taking control of that, and then when uh, uh, when the response is back, it will continue that particular activity. So uh, you are writing uh, uh, almost threaded programs, but it is actually working in an event-driven manner. Uh, so another example, uh, so this is an echo server. So you are creating a simple server and accepting uh, connections on 16,000 ports. And uh, as soon as a connection a connection uh, arrives, that part particular function is called in what is known as a gthread. It's almost like threaded program. So look at what I'm doing there. I'm uh, doing a read line. That read line will wait until the response comes back. It's like I'm I'm writing a regular threaded program. Wait for uh, wait for something to come and uh, respond something back. Uh, no callbacks attached and so on. But what internally is happening? Gvent will automatically take care of uh, uh, when, whenever I say read line, there is no data available. It will it will go back to the event loop. It will be servicing some other thread, and then uh, it will be waiting there, and then switching to another thread, and it will be handling you know tens of thousands of uh, threads per sec. Uh, it, it can handle tens of thousands of threads. If you if you run this uh, and run a performance benchmarking tool, it will show that you know it is able to handle like thousands and thousands of connections. Uh, with uh, just one process, one thread. But we have written program as if it's a regular threaded program. So this is what an event-driven program would, the G event would look like uh, without any change. But there are 
hidden problems with this kind of an approach that uh, Python community recognizes especially. Uh, one is that you don't know that, uh, okay, this is where I'm actually jumping out of my function and coming back. This has implications in terms of uh, when you have to lock your data structures and things like that, right? There is some, uh, some of that problem. But uh, Python has another uh, framework in uh, Python 3 called AsyncIO. It's, a, it's another library similar to GUN, but uh, it, does, it takes a slightly different approach. Uh, you have to add yield keyword uh, before that particular thing. And uh, various other programming languages now also have this mechanism. Uh, you either call it yield or await or something like that, uh, and you essentially do the same thing. Where, wherever you're calling yield, uh, there you are actually breaking your uh, flow of the function, going back and doing some other work and coming back and continuing there. So that's what happens with yield. So that's uh, about event-driven uh, programming. And uh, that, as in, with that essentially, on a single server, uh, which, which is like four core machine or something, we were able to handle uh, <laughs> actually all of 5,000 uh, uh, users that we wanted to target. Um, and using Python, with Python which is actually pretty slow for doing computational work. In this particular game, it was not computational intensive, it was IO intensive. Um, so we weren't computation, uh, computing huge factorials or anything like that, but we were doing simple game logic application. And because uh, the reason we chose Python was is fast to code. Um, every week or so they would come with a new requirement and they say implement this variant of the game and tr let's try it out. If it works then then we'll use it otherwise we'll discard that uh, game variant and we'll come up with a new game variant. So the game was extremely complex and we were doing this on a time frame of three months. So it was very easy for us to code in Python. So less amount of code, uh, we wrote uh, plenty of unit testing and all that. Uh, so. Uh, we were able to do uh, a lot with Python, so that's the reason we chose Python. And, and as you can see, it didn't it didn't uh, result in us losing a lot of performance. If there is any huge computation like matrix uh, multiplications and things like that, or uh, you need to do a, a intensive mathematical calculations, then you can always write a C module for Python and do that little part in uh, C module. Uh, in fact, for a particular game, we did just that. Uh, so at the beginning of the game, we had to do lots of calculations and then start the game. So it was waiting for three to four seconds to do that. And that was not acceptable, so we did a, a C module for Python. So these days, uh, most of your code is not computationally intensive. Uh, only, you know, maybe one person, two persons. Like we used to write assembly language code uh, when we write in C. Uh, for certain parts, we would pick to write in assembly, right? These days it's like that with uh, Python and C. Uh, certain bits you can write in C, rest of the things you can all happily write in uh, Python. Um, any questions? Um, Correct. It's single thread. Yes. So, yes. Uh, it's the same thread. With single thread, I'm able to handle uh, thousands of uh, applications. So, let's take this particular example. Yes, correct. Yeah. Right. Um, two things could happen, right? One, uh, you could be doing a CPU intensive operation, or you could be doing IO operation, right? So it's something like this then, okay? So at the bottom I've started a server which is receiving requests. Every time a request is received, um, my echo function gets called in a separate G thread or for G thread, but it's not actually a thread. 
So it's a fake thread. I, I'll tell you how that fake thread works. So this function got called. And then I'm doing this some uh, uh, activity here. Assume that I have declared like 100 variables and stored, did a lot of ca calculation in that 100 variables. Okay, now I have to do some uh, SQL operation, which is a blocking operation. I went here and then I said uh, uh, do that SQL call. Okay, uh, now what happens is that SQL query has been uh, given to the server. Now I have to wait. Now what GVN does is it stores the entire stack of this function, including all of those 100 variables, whatever is the state, uh, it stores that stack separately. Yeah, uh, it stores it separately, uh, not exactly stack, but uh, it takes the stack and stores it separately. Okay, uh, you can think of it like a, a list of stacks. Okay, it stored that entire state, and then it went back to uh, this main loop. Inside here somewhere there is a main loop, which is an infinite while loop. It went back to that and started uh, waiting for new uh, things to come. And uh, then another request arrived. Again, this echo function got called. This time fresh again. Uh, again, you did a hundred variable calculation. <coughs> lots and lots of state got uh, uh, computed. Now, uh, again, um, we went into that, uh, uh, issued a, a SQL call, and then we are waiting again. We went to this for loop, infinite while loop. Now the first uh, request got, uh, uh, got the response. What happens is, it will continue executing from here, but with the, all the state of the uh, first uh, request. So all that uh, state got re uh, restored, and then we started, uh, uh, we continued from there. So uh, we didn't end up creating multiple threads. We just stored all that state, uh, went somewhere else, and then came back again. Um. There, I mean, internally it does not create additional um, additional threads. Uh, so we said read line here, uh, and at this particular time, uh, a callback got attached by the Gvent library. So uh, instead of uh, saying uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 So it's like features and uh, features and promises. Um, so you you are attaching a callback and then went back into the event loop, uh, and you have stored the entire state of the uh, stack right now. And then uh, once uh, you processed a lot of other events, and then once this particular event is ready to be served, you restore that state, and then you come back uh, to executing that particular point. Yeah. So I have an asynchronous uh, mechanism for reading. So which says uh, instead of trying to go read a file, I'll say whenever there is a uh, whenever there is a uh, something to be read on that file, call this callback. So instead of using the first API, I'll use the asynchronous API. And that what that is what happens internally. Um, that might be the case. See, Node.js typically is fully event driven. If you don't run into problems and if you run typically, it won't create threads. 
even for uh, file reads and writes and threads uh, and uh, network operations. Probably when you're dealing with uh, uh, probably when you're dealing with a synchronous library, which does not give you an asynchronous API, then it probably does this uh, automatic thread creation, handling it there, and then giving you back. Or when you're doing actually creating threads to do multiple operations at the same time, probably it does that. Uh, but typically, Node.js, as far as I know, doesn't do this because Node.js is also very performant, uh, and it does that by not creating threads. For typical operations, it doesn't create threads. Uh, no, I. No, no. I, I, actually, actually, I, I'm right about that. If it is synchronous, you need a thread. Uh, but uh, we uh, we are kind of running out of time, so uh, we have to cover a couple of more topics. Um, okay, I will be a little uh, quicker here because we have ten minutes left. Um, lobby information. Each game state is continuously changing. Waiting for players. Currently playing. Finished. Showing scoreboard. About to begin a new game. These are the states that with which uh, the game st uh, changes. And then uh, 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 three people are waiting for you to join into this game. It's an important piece of information that we want to convey to other players in the entire system. So there are thousands of these games running, and all of them keep changing their state. And then tens of thousands of players are waiting for these state updates. So if you do the you know a simple uh, multiplication kind of thing. It's like huge number of events have to be conveyed to the players. Um, this is the primary challenge with uh, uh, conveying uh, the information in the lobby. If you go to the lobby, you will see thousands of uh, uh, games, and for each game you will see at least game types. For each game type, you will see okay, this is the information about the game, and uh, three people are waiting uh, in this game to play. Or uh, game type is this. Two people are waiting, and uh, 15 people are already playing this game. So that kind of information comes, and it, it gets updated every second. Uh, that is what we see in the lobby. And how do we uh, gather all of this at this particular scale and give give it to so many uh, users? Is the question here. And uh, for that, uh, a simple uh, publish subscribe model will work. What you see at the at the center is something that is helping us with uh, this publish subscribe model. So we make a network connection to that and say, um, be ready to accept uh, events from me. And then uh, lobby servers on this side connect to that server and say, uh, anything interesting happens, notify me. Now, uh, there are uh, probably dozens and dozens of those game servers running thousands of game uh, games. And every time something happens, they connect to this uh, publish subscribe server. And then they deliver an event saying that, this game has changed from this state to this state, or this game now has four players. This kind of uh, information keeps coming there. And then uh, on this side, uh, in the lobby server, there are also dozens and dozens of these servers, and they all get that information. Every single event is actually transmitted to every single uh, lobby server. This is not too much, because um, there are thousands of games, and even if we have thousands of lobby servers, like one uh, even gets multiplied into multiple lobby servers. That's not too much. What's a lot is what's here. Uh, we have tens of thousands of users waiting for those updates. Now, what lobby servers will do is aggregate some of that information. So, if uh, ten different games of the same type are, uh, are are being played, they get added up into a single game type. Instead of saying two players here, two players here, two players here, we'll say okay, six players in this particular game type. That kind of an act, somewhat aggregation happens here, and it also computes differences. So uh, my uh, my game client has connected and already has the full list of lobby. Only some small one line got changed now. So it computes that difference and sends that difference to that particular uh, user. So uh, by increasing the number of lobby servers, we're not putting too much uh, into the, onto the uh, public subscribe server. But each lobby server will be able to handle you know, thousands and thousands of uh, clients again. And so we'll be able to deal with uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, people watching for all the events that are happening on all the game. And in order to do this, uh, we use the Redis. 
Uh, Redis is very well known as a memory store which does key value storage uh, for storing sessions and so on, but it can also be used as a publish subscribe server. So Redis has a, a less known feature where you can say, um, whenever uh, an event happens on a channel, give me an, uh, give me an update. And uh, whenever some event is available, you can say, post on that channel. Um, you can also do complex store complex data structures. Redis can give you like 100,000 operations per second on a single CPU core. Uh, it's very performant, all, also done using event-driven models. So it's a pretty awesome thing. Um, and uh, Redis is, uh, is not like Cassandra, right? It, it's a single point of failure. If Redis goes down in the entire uh, system, then you are in trouble. Uh, so in order to mitigate that problem, uh, we can actually do this. Um, there's one Redis server, which is the master, and then two other servers, which are the replication. Whenever some activity happens, uh, that activity is actually replicated onto those uh, replication servers. You can have replications on a, uh, servers on a tree kind of fashion. Replication servers, below them, further replication servers, and so on. Um, uh, but obviously, the data is not synchronous. You know, you write to a master, replication will get it with a little bit of lag, not immediately. Okay, um, then you have programs called Redis Sentinel programs, which will keep watching the entire cluster. Whenever the master goes down, these sentinels will talk to each other and say, uh, do you think the master went down? Um, and then they'll say, yeah, we all agree that the master went down. Now let's pick a new master. And then uh, they will all vote and then pick a new master and then promote the uh, slave uh, replication into the master. And then uh, whatever requests are coming from the server, actually go through the sentinels by asking sentinels, okay, what is the new uh, master right now? And then uh, it will pick the new master and then it works. So uh, this is all pretty easy to set up and it's also quite uh, convenient to install and use. Um, so um, give it a try, Redis. Uh, there are obviously other programs in this category and there are also other mechanisms which, uh, which are like uh, useful for obtaining distributed logs and so on. Uh, those are also about distributed queues, uh, logs, and, uh, and a whole bunch of things. You can also explore those. Um, so, I'm not going to details. Yeah, uh, the last but one thing. So, for uh, tra doing transactions, we used regular uh, MySQL server because we need as asset transactions. So, debit something from one player and then uh, credit something to another player, or you know, do a bunch of operations in one shot. Uh, either all players start the game all at once or fail for all the uh, all the players at once. These kind of operations, they are kind of hard to do with NoSQL databases. Um, even ones which offer you some kind of a transaction capability, they don't do that very well. So, um, so we need a regular SQL database which is very good at doing this kind of stuff. So a simple uh, MySQL server will look like this server contacts the uh, database server does read-write operations. But uh, if you want to scale here, one uh, approach is to use replication servers. Uh, whatever data is written to master will also get into the replication server with a little bit of a lag. So if your application is not very critical to getting immediate results, you can e uh, do read transactions on replication servers and read write transactions on master. So uh, replications are read only. You can't write to replication servers. That's a, a constraint here. But you will get a reasonable increase in uh, performance. Wikipedia, for example, does a lot of this. Uh, they also use uh, uh, MySQL. They actually use MariaDB, which is a fork of My MySQL. Um, and uh, they do lots of uh, replication servers. Uh, when you go visit a web page, um, it's a read-only operation. So it, it can happen on a replication server. Whereas when you edit a page, they, they do it on the master. So um, this is also useful. But there is also MySQL cluster available, where this is more like Cassandra. Uh, you have partitioned your data into multiple chunks, and within each chunk, you have replication happening. So both the top nodes actually store the same data, and then uh, half of your data is stored uh, on the top nodes, and half of the data is stored on the bottom nodes. And there are separate query nodes, which can actually go and retrieve the data from here. It has a lot of uh, NoSQL capabilities also. Uh, uh, do explore that. And uh, finally, we need to test our framework. We, this cannot, you cannot scale without actually testing that scalability. 
Uh, you cannot claim that uh, we can do uh, you know, uh, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 users unless you actually test it. In, 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 in case of a game, it's slightly harder. If it's a web application, you can actually use a benchmarking tool, which, is, uh, which works right away. It, uh, the benchmarking tool will probably log in and go to a bunch of pages and generate a certain amount of load. You can, uh, without writing a single line of code, you can actually do that performance testing. But in case of uh, this multiplayer game, uh, we wrote a tool ourselves uh, using, uh, again, Python and Gvent. Uh, we connect to the game server using a client program and then behave as if a client behaves. So try to do some operation every few seconds or so, and then um, and then see if the server is able to handle all of that operations. Um, so, and then uh, uh, you would also have to scale the testing framework because if you're, uh, if you're uh, starting uh, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 uh, uh, players on the same machine, it will not be possible. Um, a framework like Locust actually allows you to start a distributed uh, set of uh, clients and then you, you can get a full set of results from all of them. Um, and then Locust is actually quite easy to deal with. Um, you can connect to a server, issue, a, issue a, any kind of uh, query and so on. You're writing a program using a framework rather than writing a plugin to, a, uh, to an existing tool. There's a, a big difference because uh, JMeter is another very popular tool, but you will end up writing plugins to it rather than using it as a framework. Uh, but this is like uh, 10 lines of code, you're like up and running, you're, you're spawning a uh, huge number of uh, uh, requests and uh, doing it like that. So uh, that's another thing to look at. Um, oh, by the way, final architecture. We put all the pieces together. Um, so we did uh, load balancing. We, we also have a, a, a replication for load balancing. Uh, so that when the load balancer fails, uh, the traffic is taken by the other load balancer. And uh, then we have game servers pushing data to Redis using publish subscribe, lobby servers picking it up, lobby servers also connecting using web sockets and uh, transmitting all those events in real time. Then, of course, before MySQL, actually we have a services layer uh, because uh, it's like an API and then we consume that API. Um, and then we have Cassandra for storing the logs. And also there are other bits, like when you want to do processing on the data and so on, you retrieve the data. But you know, this is at least, as far as the primary front-end uh, performance is concerned, this is what we're doing. Uh, we, uh, we have time for questions. Uh, I don't think we have uh, time for questions. In the interest of time, uh, we are closing. So still people, uh, I mean, those who are interested can stay and we can take questions. By the time uh, before leaving, please uh, take the feedback forms uh, so that will help us to improve for our uh, next week sessions. Um, so now actually the talk is over and if you have many questions, uh, still if you have many people, you can sit here and discuss on it. So before that, I would like to thank Sunil for uh, giving us a wonderful presentation. My pleasure. Thank you. So yeah, it's open for questions, people. Leave, you can leave others. Uh, if you want to ask questions, you can have. Anyone ask, wants to ask questions? Yes, uh, one thing that uh, does the G provide the um, facility to use multiple cores or not? Or does it manage internally or not? Um, Typically, what they say is, uh, don't try to create additional pro uh, additional threads uh, to use uh, multiple cores. The only way, by the way, you can uh, use uh, multiple cores is on threads or processes. And Gvent doesn't give you anything out of the box. Uh, although it might work if you create threads and start uh, doing uh, Gvent on each of those threads. Because in many, many server cases, we want to use all the cores. Right? Yes. We just go on to use the simple program. Yes. So we need that functionality. So does it on? No. Uh, no, it, it doesn't do that. So the typical approach to this uh, is we spawn multiple servers. Mm -hmm. So if you have uh, 24 cores in your server, we spawn 24 instances of our game uh, software, each uh, running on a particular core, and they all get load balanced as if they are running on a different instance altogether. So, what's better, I mean, uh, using multiple cores or setting to multiple servers? 
Of course, I mean, even in a single server, we have multiple cores, we have to use them. So uh, doing that is definitely the right thing. Um, and uh, uh, any typical GVN program, uh, so let's say, is able to take up 60% uh, CPU or something like that, 60 to 80% CPU. Beyond that, it might not peak to 100%. So if you have 24 cores on the CPU, then create like 20, uh, 32 uh, processes. Beyond that, don't create any more. Uh, get a new server. And uh, to start with, have at least two servers. You have like fallback when that one dies. Uh, start with two servers, um, create, a, uh, you know, a slightly over provision, create multiple uh, cores, uh, multiple processes. That's a good approach. Okay. Um, so finally, of course, uh, we, we kind of reuse a lot of these servers. So if you are running uh, uh, Redis, for example, on the same machine we used to run MySQL also. Yeah, because Redis is uh, CPU uh, uh, requiring, and uh, MySQL is typically I/O requiring, so it's not like a bad thing. Again, Cassandra is more like I/O requiring, and the game servers are all CPU requiring. They they don't do disk I/O at all. So you, we can reuse a lot of servers. Um, uh, we did that uh, with uh, about ten servers, but the load was actually quite low. As I said, uh, the target for the business was five thousand users. We just overshot uh, to a lot more. It's a private data center. But we could do the same thing in uh, in a typical cloud uh, uh, architecture also. Auto scaling was a, uh, was a, uh, was a wish list item. We never got to it. Absolutely. So, for example, uh, we could put the game servers onto uh, yeah AWS or someplace, and then uh, based on the parameters, we can uh, say you know auto scale. Yeah. You need some of those and all. And also, sometimes in my daily, I need to use load. That time, I don't want to invest in the or something. So, that time, for one hour, I can take five hours, and I can do it. There are a lot of advantages. When the client is not bothered about money, they have to use the One approach is a hybrid approach. Um, uh, one of our uh, data center providers were uh, they were providing on-demand VMs as well as uh, rack servers. So uh, run all the machines on rack servers, and when you want to scale up uh, on on the fly, just use those things. And when you scale back, discard those. Um, that also is a yeah, that's that's providing. Uh, That's true. That's true. This is the primary of the yeah. And also from the general perception that a lot of these large uh, multi scale uh, gaming companies are finally using ACA main store. Is that like a competing uh, or I mean is it worth looking at it? Uh, but you already achieved some level of scale with this uh, stack, right? Yeah. Do you recommend even uh, uh, this, I mean, uh, most of the decisions for this were made like uh, about five years ago, and there are a lot many options now. For example, event-driven frameworks have matured in most languages now, and uh, I don't know particularly about Akka. I haven't looked at it, but my friend <laughs> here uh, looked at it. Maybe he can drop a comment there. Yeah. Um... I haven't heard much of Akka being used for gaming. So uh, most uh, most gaming companies usually use something in the C plus plus area, and uh, most of the companies have their own proprietary libraries and uh, so uh, I haven't heard of Akka being used for most of the gaming. So it's like a trading or any high throughput. 
for monitoring uh, and uh, we had a team who would get alerts when something goes down uh, but we didn't see that frequent downtime and most of the application uh, architecture is in such manner that you can shut down parts of it and then uh, upgrade a version and then uh, launch it uh, because we had the load balancer shut down that particular thing and then uh, after you do then you go move on um, but in the late stages of the product, I mean, lot after we uh, did the uh, deployment and all that, we started using uh, uh, GitLab uh, CI uh, for continuous integration along with uh, Ansible for uh, provisioning. Uh, uh, as far as downtimes were concerned, we saw very little downtimes uh, because one interesting thing we did uh, was uh, uh, whenever we wanted to start a game, right? We said game dot, let's say new instance uh, in Python. And then that instance dot run. And then we put this all in a try catch block uh, because it was Python and we were doing uh, GVN programs as if they are threads, right? It's, they're, not, they're not in callbacks, they're not somewhere else. It's just a simple call, game dot run. And uh, the advantage of that is that uh, anytime the game crashes, that one single try catch block would catch everything. And then we would even send a message to the client saying that something bad happened with this particular game, you can continue to play with other games. Uh, but that also didn't happen a lot actually, because uh, you know, Python, you are handling a whole bunch of things there. Um, uh, and we also had very advanced debugging techniques. Uh, one time we had memory issues and uh, Python, uh, this GVN framework used what is known as a backdoor. Uh, Twisted also has something. Basically it's, it's just a, uh, a, a server listening on a particular port. You do a telnet into that port, telnet or uh, connect to that port, you would get a full Python shell. And then there you can uh, on the fly do debugging. You can, uh, you can start a debugger, you can uh, uh, change the value of a variable, or you can even do patching. You can code a function there, and then say my module dot function is equal to this function, and then from that point on, uh, that function will get used. Um, you can do live patching of servers, debugging. So when we had this memory problem, we said import obj graph, and then dump the obj graph into a SVG. We opened that SVG, we saw like a whole bunch of, uh, um, objects linked to each other and then a whole bunch of objects which were supposed to be free not free and then we decided oh this is the uh, this is the memory leak and then uh, that was a very rare one basically uh, we want we want uh, we we were putting it something into a, a dictionary but never removing from the dictionary so it was always there uh, it was a simple thing we fixed it uh, one time uh, generally the servers never went down one time, of course, uh, the entire data center went down in Chennai uh, when it was a really horrible uh, <clears throat> time for um, people there. Um, uh, that time the entire data center went down. Uh, we brought up the whole thing in a different data center. Yeah, that was several hours of downtime. Uh, but other than that, uh, mainly there was no other downtime in five years of operation. Uh, 10 million plus games played, I think. See, the logging servers don't access any data related to the Cassandra or MySQL. Yeah. Can you explain that? Like, if logging servers don't contain any data, they don't need any data. Actually, Redis is being used in two ways. Uh, whenever, let's say, a game server starts up, it puts a key value uh, into Redis and says, okay, this particular game, uh, this ID got started, and these are the properties for that particular game. At the same time, it would do that publish subscribe. Uh, and then if uh, a lobby server would start, 
it, it has all the information that it needs from the Redis itself. And then from that, once it has read all the uh, current data from Redis, from that point onwards, everything is coming through publish subscribe from the game servers. And it requires no other data. It's only the live data. Yeah, yeah. Only the current state of the game servers is required by lobby servers and nothing else. Um, no, I don't think Kafka ex existed back then. Um, probably we could have used it. Um, Oh, eliminate lobby servers. Uh, will you be able to do aggregation using Kafka? Uh, can clients connect using WebSocket using Kafka? Uh, those questions still need to be answered. Right? Uh, When you get a game inside the system, you also concentrate on the design of the game. Based on the design of the game, uh, you predict the kind of events can be generated for such such kind of a user state. Uh, you, you you do increase the performance are uh, uh, based on the predictions. It's it's just a game design optimization kind of stuff also used for predicting the number of events can be generated for such kind of a user state kind of stuff. Um, if that makes some sense actually. Would, would you please rephrase the In the sense, uh, uh, assume that the player is playing a game A. Yeah. Um, assume it's uh, any game. Okay. Um, uh, if the user is in such a zone, then uh, that particular game can only generate such and such events. Okay. Uh, out of n, okay, n by six can only be generated. Okay. Um, uh, so, so, possible events can be only minimal. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of things can be usually taken care. Of. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, as uh, as I first said in the load balancing slide, I mean, uh, dividing into zones uh, to minimize the uh, minimize the cross uh, state maintenance between servers uh, can definitely be thought of. But uh, you know, some uh, business cases allow for it, and some businesses cases uh, don't allow for it. So uh, we do have to, while, while scaling up, we do have to take that as one of the considerations. Uh, many of these uh, big cloud companies have multiple data centers and uh, those multiple data centers actually each data center caters to that particular region and only contacts the uh, central place when uh, when the actual data from there is required. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whether whether it's server okay. yeah yeah uh, uh, the question is uh, uh, whether server or client should take care of timers um, in, in in a game like chess for example yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, latency is a much a much bigger problem in general. But if you if you are asking from a general point of view, uh, this it's best if uh, servers can control the time march. Otherwise, you will need a lot more complicated algorithms. If if a bunch of players have to agree on a certain thing, they in a distributed fashion without nobody 
uh, being able to cheat, um, then uh, it's much harder to do in a distributed manner. So it, it's just easy to do it on a server. So most of the games actually just implement that uh, that kind of a timeout and everything on the server side. And then of course there is this uh, factor of latency. Um, uh, in this particular game also we had a lot of issues with latency uh, where some people played from very poor internet connections and then we had to identify that uh, a game uh, event happened at one point and then that arrived only a few seconds later and then we had a constant heartbeat message also being sent just to identify the latency to uh, to get a give uh, players a better uh, indication that uh, their internet connection was bad and not the server uh, doing something bad so we had to implement a whole bunch of these things to identify latency um, uh, one of the techniques we also used was when uh, initial messages came to the server we had a mechanism for measuring the latency and then when, the, uh, when, when we showed timers to the players, we would uh, take that latency into consideration. And uh, also when a message comes up, uh, we would update the latency values and that would be an adaptive uh, latency measurement uh, we would do. And then we would immediately give a notification to the player that you know your latency is really bad and because of that you're, you're probably suffering uh, your gameplay experience. That kind of reduced a lot of uh, complaints from the users. They understood that you know things were bad. Sometimes we also took uh, uh, steps that you know, if the with the current connection, the things are bad. Just establish a new connection or try to establish a new connection. If that new connection is doing good, drop the old one. We did things that like that as well. But all of those things we didn't plan for. We only implemented later. Uh, when when uh, uh, complaints started flowing in and so on, we that was an experience for us. Uh, so to maintain timers, uh, do it on the server side, because it is hard for the two players to agree upon. Uh, uh, the, this player might say, uh, "My time is still not up," and then uh, how does the other player uh, okay or not okay that? Right? Uh, they, they both have to agree. And how do they agree on something? Uh, it can be done much more easily on a server side, um, or implement uh, uh, an algorithm such that uh, even if one player is trying to cheat, uh, the other player would detect it and cancel the game or something like that. Okay. That having said, uh, you have to uh, measure that latency between the players and then uh, also accommodate that latency. So, for example, uh, if the, if one player has like one uh, one minute of time, but but is suffering two seconds of latency. Show not uh, one minute, but show like 58 seconds. 